Do you know? The world is full of lonely people who are afraid to take the first step. In 1962, New York's Copa nightclub was feasting, singing and dancing. Tony who works here is smart and capable. He can solve all kinds of troublesome things at any time. For those guests who fight and make trouble, Tony likes to use his fists to solve the problem. Sometimes in order to earn more money, he will play tricks. He will steal the rich man's hat first. And when the rich man is about to lose his temper, he will tell the rich man that he has found the hat. With a solid tongue, you can not only get tips, but also earn favors. Tony is an Italian-American whose family are devout Christians. His wife Dolores is gentle and beautiful, and his two sons are sunny and cheerful. In addition, he has many relatives and it's fun when all of them get together. Although not rich, life is easy and comfortable. The day two black maintenance workers came to the house, the wife enthusiastically poured water for them. Then Tony threw their used cups into the trash can in disgust. The wife shook her head helplessly when she saw it. During the meal, Tony mentioned something annoying. Copa nightclub is closing for renovations and he will be out of work for the next two months. His wife and children are still waiting for him to support him. And he has to pay rent every month. To earn some extra money, he went to the restaurant to participate in the Big Eater competition. In the end, he won the game with a brilliant record of 26 hot dogs and won the bonus. He loved his wife very much and handed over the bonus to his wife as soon as he got home. But he can't rely on this to win money every day. He has to find a way to make more money. A friend had just introduced him to a job where a doctor named Shelley wanted to hire a driver. The next afternoon, Tony found Dr. Shelley's residence according to the address. Shelley's room is filled with all kinds of high-end artwork. To Tony's surprise, Shelley was black. When he appeared in front of Tony in gorgeous clothes, Tony froze for a moment. The 1960s was the most severe period of racial conflict in the United States. Apartheid made a distinction between blacks and whites. Black people are considered inferior and can only work in the fields or work as waiters in bars. It's the first time Tony has seen such a noble and elegant black man. Shelley is a renowned pianist who recently planned a tour in the South. He needs to hire a temporary driver for two months at a good salary. But the further south you go, the more serious the people's discrimination against black people. Dr. Shelley needed a savvy and capable person to help him. It was obvious that Tony was the perfect person for the job. However, Tony did not want to be a full-time nanny. Despite his financial difficulties, he gave a number of reasons he hoped Shelley would turn him down, such as the high salary. The next day, Dr. Shelley called Dolores personally, said that she would rent her husband for two months, and the salary would be in accordance with Tony's request. The high salary made Tony very surprised, and his wife also agreed to the job. So, Tony became Dr. Shelley's driver. The record company paid half of his salary in advance, and the other half, he paid him after the tour. Then they gave Tony a book, which was called The Green Book, a travel guide for black people. The book was written by the black postman, Green, marked in detail which bars, restaurants and hotels allow blacks to enter. This will help fellow blacks to avoid the risks of this journey and they must use this book. After bidding farewell to relatives, Tony is ready to hit the road. His wife told him to go home before Christmas and write to him on the way. The record company provided them with two beautiful sports cars. Accompanying them are two fiddlers, performing a trio with Shelley. After departure, Shelley made two basic requests to Tony. At every stop, Tony has to check in advance whether the piano is a Steinway and make sure a bottle of whiskey is delivered to his room every night. Shirley is unsmiling and courteous, while Tony is a habitual, casual person, smoking a cigarette while munching on a hot dog. In this way, two people with completely different personalities and lifestyles started their journey. Tony likes to smoke and Shelley insists that he put it out. Shelley likes to be quiet, but Tony is a man who can't control his mouth. In the evening, they reached their first destination, Pittsburgh. The two fiddler companions are having a rich nightlife, but Shelley is sitting alone on the balcony drinking. Before the next day's performance, Shelley gave Tony some advice. He wants Tony to improve his behavior, pay attention to his wording and tone of voice, because he was going to introduce Tony to the audience after the show. But Tony is used to being comfortable and can't stand being restrained. He replied without panic, if the upper class doesn't like me talking, they should walk away. Not me. Before the program began, the host introduced Dr. Shelley. He has a lot of halos on his head. He began to perform publicly at the age of three and held a symphony concert at the age of 18. In the past more than a year, he was directly invited by the presidential palace to perform twice at the White House. He also holds a triple doctorate in psychology, musicology, and ritual arts. The evening was a great success. 
with Shelley's piano artistry conquering the audience. Tony, who has been watching by the window, admires this music master very much in his heart. The next night, they reached their second stop. Ohio, Tony wrote a letter to his wife, writing the letter like an assembly line, telling him about his daily life. He thinks Dr. Shelley is a musical genius, but he's always brooding, and the genius doesn't seem to be having much fun, preferring to be alone. The next day, when the car came to a small store, Tony said he wanted to get out to buy a pack of cigarettes. There is an unattended stand outside the little shop selling some nice ores. Tony picked up a rock on the ground and put it in his pocket. Shelly was very angry when he found out and ordered him to take the stone back and pay for it. But Tony's reason is that he picked it up from the ground, not stole it from the box. Two people with completely different life experiences and ideas started a debate like this. Although Tony was upset, he listened to Shelly, got out of the car and put the stone back in the stall. The third stop. They came to Indiana. The organizer did not provide Steinway pianos as agreed in the contract and throw a lot of trash on the piano. It's clearly provocative. The staff also said that niggas play everything the same. Why are there so many demands? After negotiating for a long time, Tony found that he couldn't communicate with the other party. In the end, Tony used his fist to get the result he wanted. For the evening performance, Shelley got to use a Steinway piano, as she had hoped. The next stop is Kentucky in the South and their troubles will only increase. When he was about to arrive in Kentucky, the gluttonous Tony bought a big bucket of fried chicken. He ate while driving, but Shelley wasn't interested. Because in the United States, fried chicken and corn paste have almost become synonymous with black people. Shelley says he never eats fried chicken, but Tony insists on forcing him to eat it. At Tony's repeated requests, Shelley let go of his reserve and unnaturally picked up the chicken leg and not on it. It's just that the way he eats chicken is very different from Tony. At this time Tony talked about his father. My father said that you have to go all out in everything you do. Work hard when you are working, and laugh when you are happy. When eating delicious food, it should be enjoyed as the last meal. In the evening, they arrived at a hotel that only accepted blacks. According to the Green Book, this hotel is very dilapidated. Even if Shelley has money, he can only stay here. Tony went to the white man's hotel and ate pizza while studying the Green Book. Suddenly someone knocked on the door and came to him, informing him that something had happened to Shelly. It turns out that Shelly went to a bar to drink and was beaten up by some racists. Tony rushed over and yelled at them to let them go. The other party was not intimidated by Tony, and he took out his dagger and wanted to fight him. Tony puts his hands on his waist and pretends to draw a gun, threatening to shoot them through the heads. After a battle of wits, Tony rescued Shelly. Shelly thinks Tony is just bluffing and that he definitely doesn't have a gun. Instead, what Tony wants to say is that you will not be allowed to go anywhere without me in the future. Facing the bright sunshine of the next day, they continued to the next stop. Halfway through the walk, the car broke down and Tony was busy fixing it while Shelly was resting. It's just that in the farmland across the road, black slave laborers are working very hard. They are all black, but their fate has a gap like heaven and hell. In this way, looking at each other, each has a feeling in my heart. After arriving at the destination, the owner of the farm was very enthusiastic. In the evening, the owner of the farm prepared fried chicken for Shelly. Although it was a little embarrassing, he still completed the performance with great dedication. During the intermission, he wanted to use the bathroom, but the owner refused to let him use it. Instead, let him go to the temporary wooden shed outside to solve the problem. Shelly doesn't want to be insulted. He'd rather drive the car back to the hotel to go to the bathroom. But at the end of the show, Shelly was still able to shake hands with grace with the man who had just insulted him. Tony doesn't understand. The violinist came up to him and said that there would be many such things in the future. Shelly could have stayed up north, been respected at fancy parties, and made three times as much money. But he insisted on coming to the south. And do you know why he did? The next day, Tony was writing a letter to his wife and Shelly brought it over to read it. I found this letter to be unclear, with many typos similar to a kidnapping letter. According to what he wanted to express, Shelley helped him read a letter like a poem. Walking down the streets of Georgia, Shelley has her eye on a suit, but the shop owner saw that he was black and refused to serve him. Although Shelley was humiliated again, he remained polite. At night, he vented all his anger and humiliation on the keys. Vent your emotions with a hearty performance, which arouses thunderous applause from the audience. Shirley was caught by police late at night with a gay man in a hotel room. They were humiliated and beaten, and Tony rushed to his rescue. Tony rushed over immediately and settled the matter by bribing. Shelley is a man of principle who believes that Tony should not pay bribes. 
Tony also felt very wronged and called him an ungrateful bastard. After a big quarrel, the two returned to their respective hotels. After arriving in Memphis the next day, Tony actually ran into an old friend. Although they were talking in Italian, Shelly understood. Tony's friend can find him a job that pays big money. No need to work for a nigga. Tony said he rejected his friend. And Shelly listened like a helpless child. He sincerely apologizes to Tony for what happened last night. Tony said lightly, don't take it to heart. The world is already very complicated. The two made their way south and every show was a success. And Tony's letter is like a love letter from the first love. The wife is full of joy when she sees it. After the show in Mississippi, it rained heavily during the night. The police stopped them on the side of the road and ordered them to get out of the car. They say the name of this place is Sunset Town. Black people are not allowed to stay in the area after sunset. Tony's defense of Shelly raises police hackles. Tony's name is Italian and the cops called him a half nigger. Enraged, Tony punched the cop who humiliated him unconscious. Another policeman quickly pulled out a pistol, and finally they were escorted back to the police station. Shelly's show isn't over yet, but he's in custody. He claims to call his own lawyer, which is his right. The cops aren't afraid at all. Just let this nigga make a call. So what? But it didn't take long for the police to receive a call from the governor. The local governor ordered them to release people quickly. This is an order from the presidential palace. A few policemen became wilted in an instant, so they could only be obedient and let them go immediately. Tony just found out that Shelley just called Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy US Attorney General, who was also the brother of President John F. Kennedy. Tony felt very proud, but Don Shirley felt very ashamed. The Kennedy brothers are trying to change the status quo in this country and he's bothering them for such unimportant things. Because the two people have different ideas. Everyone is arguing for themselves. The more noisy the more fierce. Tony said. I look more black person than you. You know nothing about your race. What to eat. How to talk. How to live. What kind of music you like. You live in a castle and sit on a throne. And I try to support my family every day. Tony said. The way I live is the way black people look. Shelley's long simmering emotions finally exploded. He told Tony to pull over, and in the pouring rain, he angrily yelled at Tony, I do live in a castle, but I am alone. White people pay me to play the piano. It makes them feel cultured, but as soon as I step off the stage I'm a nigga they don't care about. I suffer the slights alone because I'm not black enough and I'm not white enough. I can't fit in with black people and white people won't really accept me. I'm not even a man. Tony. You tell me who I am. Tony felt sorry for Shirley after hearing this, but he didn't know how to comfort him. For their final show in Birmingham, they arrived just before sunset. The hotel manager is polite on the surface, but in fact he is very discriminating against black people. He found a small utility room in the back kitchen that served as Shelley's dressing room. During the meal in the restaurant, the fiddler said something to Tony. Shirley went to the south to perform. Talent alone is not enough. It takes courage to change hearts and minds. At this time, the waiter refused Shelley to enter the restaurant on the grounds of restaurant tradition. The manager reluctantly said that someone can send the food to the utility room. At this point, Shelley responded, either I eat here or I quit. The manager wants to buy Tony with money so that he can persuade Shelley, but his goddamn remarks completely pissed Tony off. Just when Tony insulted Don Shirley because of this manager and was about to teach him a lesson, Don Shirley's trembling voice said it's okay to Tony, if you want me on stage, I'll do it, I'll listen to you, but Tony said coolly, let's get out of this ghost place. After the two came out, they came to a restaurant full of black people, because of the skin color. Tony is an outlier here. Everyone's eyes made him uncomfortable. But what he doesn't know is that black people suffer from the same look every day. Shelly pulled out a handful of bills and ordered whiskey and two fried chicken packages. The waiter at the bar asked him what his job was. Shelly tried to keep a low profile. But Tony rushed to say. He is the greatest pianist in the world. The waiter said that there is a piano on the stage over there. But it is not a Steinway piano. This bar isn't Foley's Grand Music Hall either, but this performance is the most perfect one of the whole trip. Shelley's fingertips danced on the keys, flowing clouds and flowing water in one go. Everyone applauded for him. Then the band from the bar came on stage to play with the ensemble and Shelley completely opened up and let loose. This is the performance he dedicated to himself. And it is also the happiest performance. As soon as they walked out of the bar, they met two thieves who were stealing. The two thieves were so frightened that they rolled and crawled. Tony said never show your riches in a bar. That's when Shelley realized he really did have a gun. That night, they drove all the way back north. The further north, the colder the weather. When we approached New York, it was already snowing heavily. After running in all the way, 
the two have become more and more understanding of each other. Shelly has already guessed that the lucky stone Tony picked up must not be returned. By night, Tony was too tired to keep his eyes open. He originally planned to go back to reunite with his family on Christmas Eve. But it seems impossible. Shelly let him rest in the back seat and drove him home himself. Tony wanted to invite him to his house. But Shelly was used to being alone. They said Merry Christmas to each other and Shelly drove away. At this time, Tony's big family is celebrating Christmas with him Mai. The family warmly welcomes the man home and the wife sends a warm kiss. Shelly returns to his luxurious, empty castle. He told the servant to hurry back to be with his family. Then he took out the lucky stone and sat alone in a pile of high-end artwork and stared. At the dinner table, the family asked Tony how the traveling nigger was doing. Did he mess with you? Tony said seriously. Don't call him that. After hearing this, the wife looked at Tony in surprise and relief. But at this moment, there was a knock on the door. Shelly is standing outside the door holding a bottle of red wine. Tony gave him a warm welcome and solemnly introduced him to his family. Dolores gave Shelly a friendly hug and whispered thank you for helping him write this letter.